Perspective, presented by the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association, following a few principles of humanism. We're committed to the use of science and reason for understanding the universe and for solving human problems. We're skeptical of untested claims of knowledge, but we're open to new ideas. We are concerned with securing justice and fairness in society and in ending intolerance and discrimination. We are committed to the total separation of religion and government. We affirm humanism as a realistic alternative to the theologies of despair and the ideologies of violence. We reject the concept of an afterlife and believe in living a full and rewarding life here and now. We value and respect each individual's right to judge and lead their lives according to their own position as long as it's respectful of other people living in a free society. We hope you enjoy today's program and others in the weeks to follow. Hello again. Thanks for being here. I'm Harry Greenberger. I am the, uh, currently the president of the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association and the host for this show. And as you heard in that introduction, since we um, humanists are, are satisfied that this life we have here is the only one we're going to have, uh, we feel that the, uh, that the best thing to do is to live it fully and as rewardingly as we can, so long as we don't prevent other people from doing the same thing. And of course, one of the parts of a full and enjoyable and rewarding life will be the arts. And so today, our guest is here to talk about the subject of arts, and our, and our guest is Gene Nathan, who is the executive director of the Creative Alliance of New Orleans. She is also the host of a radio show called Crosstown Conversations on WBOK. So Gene, I'm just going to let you take over and tell us about the Creative Alliance. Well, Harry, the Creative Alliance of New Orleans was formed um, not too long after Katrina. Um, we had actually been thinking about and talking about the importance of the creative sector of the city and um, the arts in general for some time. And I worked very closely with the um, Landry administration when he was uh, lieutenant governor to help support the idea of supporting the cultural economy. But after the storm, it was really important to make sure that our creatives came home. And that includes the visual, performing, design, media, literary, and culinary arts. It's, we, we deal with all the arts, not just with visual. And we deal with the arts in a business context, not strictly about what's up on the walls in a museum or, uh, or what's in the concert hall, but more about how an ar artist can make a living from their art. So our mission is basically um, uh, to provide training, education, and information for creative artists, cultural producers, and the community, and to protect our cultural legacy and to promote the revitalization of the city as a cultural and economic center. As I understand what I have read about your organization, you also are trying to encourage New Orleanians and people in our area to take an interest in and actually start collections of art. Is, am I correct? That's one of the things that we do, and, and the reason we do that, again, to promote people to collect art is to make sure that they actually buy art and so that you can sustain the artists who live here. We had, before the storm, a very robust arts community. I would say uh, really over the past um, 20 years or so, maybe 30, especially since the Contemporary Arts Center was founded, I like to say that it, it contributed to kind of stirring things up. And you were involved with the I creation of the Contemporary of, Arts Center. I was Center. one of a, a group of artists and, and, and uh, civic leaders who said we really need a place to show the work of living artists. Because if you don't buy the work of living artists, they can't make art. And ultimately they either move on to another community Community, moves to someplace else or they go on to other jobs to make a living so it's important to make sure somebody buys the work now so, is the concept of starving artists is that kind of uh, passe absolutely not they're still um, now 
there are artists who uh, don't do anything else but make their art, and if they're not recognized, then they're living a pretty lean existence. But a lot of the young artists today are multifaceted, and so they find other ways to make a living. The problem with that is that once they get involved in this and that and that job, it's very hard for them to continue to, to really focus on and do their work. So. To promote collecting, one of the things we do is something called Art Home New Orleans. That's what I was going to ask you about because... How do we do because it? Because a recent <laughs> uh, Time Speaking Union article talked about the, that tour that you do, and that's what uh, what uh, spurred me on to give you a call. Oh, okay. All right. Well, um, what we do is... Um, a couple, uh, several times a year. We used to do it just once a year, and then we just decided that it was so popular, people really love it, that we're going to do it um, really in conjunction with the Neighborhood Partnership Network that focuses on a neighborhood every two months. They do a big uh, spread in their trumpet newspaper about a given neighborhood. So every time they do that, we're going to do that neighborhood with the tour. But what we do is we ask people to open their homes and show their collections and artists to open their studios and show their work. So it's a combination of private homes and art studios and we we used to do it citywide we did uh, one recently in just one neighborhood in the uh, Holy Cross Lower Ninth Ward neighborhood and we really liked that one because people could kind of get around to more of the houses whereas when we did it citywide it was a little bit too much and people couldn't get everywhere so now we're going to do it a neighborhood at the time about um, four or five times a year and we also do it on a custom basis so if you've got a group of friends who are coming to town and and you want them to see the inside New Orleans, because it's kind of the inside, right? Okay. It's open the door and go into somebody's really very interesting homes. And one of the points that we're trying to make is that you don't have to have a huge budget. You don't have to be buying Picassos. There are a lot of young artists in town. There are a lot of unrecognized artists. And their work is not expensive, and it's good. So you don't have to buy a $50,000 Blue Dog, you can go down to the St. Claude Avenue area to some of the galleries down there that are open every second Saturday. They have a big opening the way Julia Street has an opening once a month um, on the first weekend. And you can see the work, and for a few hundred dollars, the price of a suit, you can own an original work of art. When you mention St. Claude area, that area, St. Claude, Marigny, <coughs> and Bywater, appears to me to be the new cultural area of the city. Is it's, that ex it's exploding. It's absolutely exploding. And um, what's interesting about it is it's artist-driven. So they're really, most of those galleries are co-op galleries that the artists have come together put in a little bit of money, each one of them, to pay a fairly low lower rent because, you know, St. Claude was not exactly Fifth Avenue or St. Charles Avenue, right? It was it had seen its day, so to speak, but its day is coming back now. And you've got over 20 art galleries down there. I think maybe the nucleus of, of, a, <laughs> of renaissance in that area is the New Orleans Healing Center. Um, I would say that's one of them, but you know, uh, really, even before the Healing Center, um, there's two galleries called The Front and the Good Children Gallery, and it's just a few blocks above the bridge over the canal. They started, and they just opened on their own, you know, four or five of them pulled their dollars to pay for the rent, and they put on, I want to tell you something. Some of the best art in the city of New Orleans is being shown in those galleries right now. It is serious art. It is not derivative. It is not junk. It is very serious, good art and accessible. It's not so far fetched that people can't yes. understand and appreciate it. It's, it's well, great. It's good art. Having been involved in the art business for many years myself, our position our, in our gallery was to tell potential clients buy something you like don't buy something because you think you can make money later reselling right. it. That's buy right. something you like and these galleries that you're talking about with new emerging artists or artists who do not yet have big reputation is an opportunity to buy something you like and if it appreciates in value that's a bonus and not only that but I would have to say just just going to their opening on that second Saturday, go down there around 6 o'clock, 6 to 8 or so, actually it goes later, is to see all these young people who have 
come back to the city, decided to stay here, or newly come. I can't tell you how many people down there have moved here from Brooklyn, from Boston, from Minneapolis, from Chicago, everywhere. You mean you've since got, Katrina? Yes. You've got this melting pot of young talent that is just phenomenal. So one of the things that we're concerned about, though, the Creative Alliance, and we call ourselves Cano, by the way, is to make sure that they have an opportunity to sell their work. So we also get involved in helping them function as businesses. A lot of artists don't want to even think about business, but the artists who really do well are the ones who understand that they have to function as business people and artists. It's and so we try to help them do that. It's not something that comes easily to art people who are artistically inclined. They find it very difficult to to also be a business person. I, you know, I think it's very individual. Some artists that I know are phenomenally marketing and business oriented and they do really well and some are more want to just work in their studio, make their work and are almost afraid to show it and then there are those who show their work a lot but really just don't deal with the business side. So we do a thing called creative capital um, training sessions which involves a uh, an organization out of New York that's one of the gold standards of business training and they put on um, the program and we're expanding that. The other thing we're trying to do is work with the young people in New Orleans because I'm from New York. New York is a very creative place but it's because it's a marketplace and people come to New York from everywhere but in New Orleans if you go to any high school you're going to just be shocked at how many of the young people in those schools are creative. So what we're doing now is trying to help those creative students know about further education that they can get to help them shape careers in the creative so industries. So you're really starting at an early age for these people. Well, you know, it's not early childhood, and there are a no, lot of I programs mean, that are aimed at... high school is still an early age to... High school is, if you, if you remember yourself, I'll bet anything that you started your interest in art when you were, say, like right around junior high school, early high school. You're asking me to go back a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that uh, most creative people start noticing their creative interests young. I sat in an auditorium at the John McDonough High School recently with an arbitrary group of kids who just were hanging out there getting ready to go home and to talk about our program which is called Creative Futures. And it was just amazing how many of them were interested in the arts. So as I talked about our program of training them to be able to go into creative uh, high school uh, colleges, um, one after another was saying, well, I want to be a graphic artist. Um, the other one said they wanted to be an audio engineer. Mm -hmm. Another one said he wanted to be a comedian. Another one wanted to be a, a um, theatrical person. I mean, the, the level of creative interest was amazing. And then we, we had our first open house. The school gave us two classrooms to work in. And our first open house, 60 students showed up at lunchtime. To, instead of hanging out with kids in the cafeteria, they came to see what we were at. And they've been coming back. So I say that we have tremendous creativity in the city. <clears throat> the importance is to make sure that they can make a living from it. And the other thing is, Harry, the business community doesn't really take the cultural economy seriously to Some a too great did, an extent. Because many of them, like Jefferson Performing Arts Society, they get a lot of backing from the business community. Some of them do, but I but I but you're right, in general. They they get backing as an arts institution showing art. But when you want to talk to public, business, and civic leaders about the arts as economic development, that's a tougher conversation because they tend to think about arts and association as a quality of life issue and not as an economic engine. Yes. The truth of the matter is the study that Mitch commissioned, uh, Mitch Lander commissioned as lieutenant governor, oh, it was 2004, said that the cultural economy is the second highest employer of people in the state. That yes. fact got a little bit lost because the announcement came days before, before the storm. Katrina. Yeah. And so, you know, I've been disappointed that more people didn't get that message. But so our other assignment of our organization is to try to increase the awareness and the commitment to investing in the creative economy 
for business development purposes, yes. not just quality of now, life. When you mentioned earlier that you're concerned with more than just the visual arts, yes. and I have been very much impressed with the uh, local theaters in New Orleans. Back in the early days, and I, I served on the board of directors of Gallery Circle Theater, there was only Le Petit and Gallery Circle. There were two local theaters. Right. Now, if you, if you look around and you look in the listings of the newspaper, there are local theaters all over the, the city. city. Isn't that something? And with, mm -hmm. with, product, with local actors and local pro directors and producers, and, uh, and and it's uh, it it really is very impressive. You know, it used to be that you could look in the newspaper and see what Le Petit was doing, Southern Rep was doing, and uh, maybe the Lyric Theater up at Tulane, and <clears throat> and maybe something might be happening at the Sanger. Now, sometimes you you, you look at, at, at online or in the paper, and you're going to see literally, as you say, dozens of productions all over the city. The Fringe Festival just recently. Yes. They had six. Hundred performances around town. Now, not all of that was local companies. A lot of it was people coming in from elsewhere. But that's the other thing. We are now getting a lot more um, visual, all the arts, music people, theater people, coming to New Orleans to present what they're doing. And that's what makes for a cultural center. And that's, right. that's what really New York is known for, is all those international things coming there. And we're starting to see that and here, so, which so I think is mission, great. So your mission, your mission of the Creative Alliance is exactly what? It is to promote um, career opportunities for artists, to make sure that artists of all disciplines can actually make a living from their talent rather than having those day jobs and those night jobs to support themselves. And it is to generate and um, promote investment into the creative economy. So we'd like to see, for example, you see these incentive programs that have brought the film industry here and are helping to bring the digital industry. We'd like to see some kind of either an incentive program or an investment fund at the state level that will result in actually contributing to small businesses that are creative oriented. I went yesterday to a, a very interesting little group of, uh, it was a round table that the Idea Village people uh, put on. Uh, and it was, uh, there were about 20 people around the table and there were all these young people who were doing all these um, an initiatives. There was one woman who's organizing film conferences to help people in the film industry who want to enter it, not the big guys, but the homegrown folks to understand what they can do. Because a lot of people are worried about when the incentives go away, will there still be an interest in the film business here? Um, because someday some city is going to come up with a better formula than us. And, and in order for us to keep the film business, it has to be more homegrown. So how do you grow it? How do you support the um, smaller companies that are coming up here? And she's working on that. Another one was doing something where she was really helping people to deal with copyright and intellectual property issues. There was another guy that was dealing with radio uh, and broadcast opportunities. Uh, it, it was just a table full of people thinking about how to grow the creative industries, but they all need investment. And so at the same time that we're talking about the port and the biomedical district and distribution and, you know, those... Tourism. Tourism. We have and, to talk and, about And that. tourism, you know, tourism is another industry that really has not been respected as much as it should be over the and years. It's a high, it is a highly pr pr productive industry. It is, it is the, it's, it's the other arm, in a way, of the creative industries. You know, the cultural is what brings people here. But by the way, I have to tell you, a lot more money goes into marketing sort of a general message of tourism in the city, and not enough goes into marketing all these cultural things. Cultural tourism. You know? For it's which just, New Orleans, we're not, we're not could, getting the New Orleans could be a leader, and maybe is a leader in cultural tourism, because we've got it here. We could be, but we're not because we're not putting the money in it. Now I have a question, uh, which I have to ask, because you're, you've told me what your Creative Alliance is aiming for. What what is your prognosis? What are the prospects for the future? I think New Orleans is on the cusp of being a, the creative center that we all of us who live here and, and hope for the city have always thought it could be. 
more so than any time since I've lived here. I've been here since um, 72, so that's 40 years, right? <laughs> well, we, <laughs> I've been here for 40 years uh, beating this drum, and at this point, I really feel that as never before, we have the opportunity. Be for one thing, again, you have all these young people coming to town, and they're determined. This is a, they're, they're not afraid of being independent producers. They're not afraid of being entrepreneurs. And they're pretty determined to make things happen. I just worry about them being able to get the capital to do what they want. So if we can come up with a little bit a stronger a commitment, again, from the public and the business sector to support what these kids are doing, New Orleans can be, I think, very competitive on the international scene. We are already, you know, the tourism people have been successful in positioning New Orleans as one of the leading tourist destinations in the world. Yes. Largely, again, because of our culture. But so, people like to make sure that culture... And the arts, oh, architecture, yeah. the landscape. I, I, yes. I, I often say that one of the legs of our community that are, are missing in our, our tourism promotion is our landscape and our gardens. Oh, yeah. You know, I started a program at the Botanical Garden a few years ago called Heart of the Gardens. And I said the Botanical Garden it should be a gateway to all the beautiful gardens in the city. And I created a tour that now Gray Line is actually doing called Heart of the Gardens Tour. And they take people to see see the Botanical Garden, Longview, and they travel through the city and show off the private gardens. Just when every other part of the country is going dormant in the winter, we're having our winter flower season. All our sasanquas and camellias are starting to come out now. And yes. By the time they finish off, the magnolias and the azaleas start coming in, and then you have the gar you know the gardenias and then the crepe myrtles and the oleander. I mean, we're just in flower all year round. I can see that you're enthusiastic about all the aspects of this city. Let me yes. ask you this, because <laughs> you're, you, you, you're looking for funding for the for the various arts. How was your organization funded? Oh, um, <laughs> a combination of um, some grants from uh, some very generous foundations. One of our most generous um, contributors is the Joan Mitchell Foundation. And, you know, Joan Mitchell, you may be familiar with her as an abstract artist. And uh, when she died not too long ago, she built a foundation to support artists. Mm -hmm. She's more visual artist oriented, but she contrib her organization contributes now to um, a lot of courses so they're one of our most uh, you know uh, uh, most uh, important sources of but are you uh, a income. membership organization we're, we're, we are membership to some extent we haven't really built up um, a, a membership dues process that much um, so we're mainly reliant at the moment on grants and on earned income those tours that we do mm -hmm. we charge for them mm -hmm. and when we do a custom tour for some group that's coming into the city that's some decent money that we're able to pull in. Um, other than that, I lend half of my house to the organization. <laughs> well, <you laughs> so that helps, too. No question that you are very much enthusiastic and involved in, in what you're doing, but you always have been, and you've always been connected to, to the arts, not, 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 not least of which because your husband is one of New Orleans' famous artists. Well, my husband is an artist. My sister is an artist. My father was a um, self, more or less self-taught um, artist who really didn't sell his work, but he made art. I was supposed to be an artist, but I talked too much. So I became more of a talker about the arts as opposed to an artist. Uh, Although well, I do my Sunday work, you know. I do uh, my Sunday painting. Well, I'm painting. glad you're a talker because the, that's, what, that's why I have you on this show. <laughs> Uh, well, tell us tell us more about, about that that you haven't told us about what your alliance is. is involved well, in. you know what? I, I don't know when this show is going to air, but um, if it's next gonna, week, perfect. So, what's coming up is our uh, our fundraiser, uh, which is called All Gowned Up: A Bal Des Artistes. Now, Harry, I don't think you're around long enough to know about the original Bal Des Artistes, but these were sort of bohemian carnival balls that were held by the artists, the Arts and Crafts Club of New Orleans. It was based in the French Quarter when the French Quarter was basically what Bywater is now, when it was kind of a, you know, a neighborhood that was not in great shape and the artists had moved in and they did these um, kind of wild 
carnival balls, which is what I think a carnival ball should be, rather than, you know, the more structured kind of things we have, which I've enjoyed. But um, I, I, we're going to do a ball that's going to be a lot of fun. And we have a fashion show with gowns that have been donated by New Orleans women who have, you know, are involved with the crews and the carnival organizations and, and just go out a lot at night. Um, young artists uh, who, um, young designers who design work, and then um, artists. So we're going to have gowns and costumes designed by artists and designers and, and by uh, traditional... And, and this is the first time you have produced this You know, ball. we did this thing called Hot and Bothered. I don't know if he can zero in on this. Yeah. We, we did this in, in, in uh, June for the summer solstice. Okay. And uh, this was a show of uh, swim and summer wear um, that we did around a pool. The um, wonderful uh, Calvin and, and um, Francis Fayard were so kind as to allow us to use the wedding cake house, and we did a fashion show around the pool, and that was quite an event. And a lot of people said, wow, this is, was a very special event. Is that so, like the swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, um, it was kind of provocative, All right. but the now, fun part was we had two designers, Elizabeth um, Eckert and uh, Tri, um, Triana is actually her full name, um, who designed cocktail clothes, gowns and dresses and clothes out of swim fabrics so that you could actually swim in them. And so some of our models who were dressed in their clothes actually went into the pool, swam, and came mm. out. So that was now, kind of, the guys to, like that part. Back to your upcoming event. Now, upcoming, when is that? January 3rd, and we just this week settled on the location, and it's a very unusual place, brand new. I don't know if you've even been yet to the new morning call at the casino in City Park. I have not. I knew it was there. Now, listen, we just got a couple minutes left. Okay. If you want people to get in touch with you or if they want to know more about what you're doing, tell them how they do that. I think the easiest thing for me to do, I can give you two things. The phone number is 218 Four eight zero seven. That's five zero four two one eight four eight zero seven. Or our webs. Uh, uh, rather, uh, for now, come to our uh, email and so go to Nathan at Cano hyphen L A dot org. Nathan at Cano C A N O hyphen L A dot org. This is going to be. Uh, incredible because it's going to be a lot of music, a lot of dancing, and the fashion show of things. And it, it'll be an auction, so you can buy the gowns and the costumes that have been designed by New Orleans artists and de designers I and That's belong to uh, be, women who have donated their so gowns. So you're expecting that to be quite a major it's event. It's going to be a major. It's going to be and a bohemian a, you, carnival ball. And you're expecting that to be an annual event. Uh, definitely. We are going to be doing that as an annual event. Well, you certainly are very busy people. Uh, Why not? What else now, are you going to do? Are you looking for volunteers or help? Absolutely. Volunteers, call us, 218-4807. We especially if you have some creative interests. You don't have All to right. be an artist, just like the arts. Jean, it's amazing, but our time is up. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. I want to thank you folks who are watching our show for being with us and uh, hope that this will be a, a, a habit of yours. Uh, watch us every week. <laughs>